and he, he, he was shocked, and he said, don't ever do that, and he, he wrenched it out of my hand. But I was able to quickly read that it was some kind of intelligence file on Central Intelligence Agency letterhead in which some intelligence analyst had had access to my paper and had passed along passages to my father in this briefing document that were highly unrepresentative of, or misrepresentative, I should say, of what my paper as published ultimately constituted. The second incident was about a year later, around 1969. My dad was um, giving me a haircut up in the study uh, on the third floor of our house. He used to take the kitchen stool up there, a kitchen chair, and he would put an apron around us and give us, you know, a haircut, like a crew cut of that era. And we had a large family, you know, so we were always um, trying to do the prudent thing and not, and, you know, in this case, he was providing a haircut rather than having to pay for it for his, you know, three sons. Mm-hmm. And um, and during that, when he sat me down in the chair and put the apron around me to, to cut my hair, he went over to an area of the study there where he put something on one of our, our, our desks. He had made five desks for us to do our homework at. My dad was very handy. He was an excellent carpenter. He made these beautiful desks for us. And um, he opened one of the drawers and he took out a manila envelope that had a red wax seal and a tie string, but it had already been opened. So he undid the tie string and he pulled out a single, a single page and it had a single image on it. And what that image was, was the photograph, the photographic detail of a Martian humanoid that is in my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars. Now, that humanoid can be seen on what we're, an area that we're calling the rock enclosure. It's an intentionally assembled group of, of rocks. At least one of them is intentionally assembled. In fact, it has a carving of a solar-like face on it that is in the right middle portion of Silkovsky Ridge, which can be found in the left uh, middle distance of NASA image PIA 10214. That is one of the several humanoids that I discovered in that image. And um, my father showed me the image and said, do you know what this is? And I said, no, what? He said, it's a Martian. And I said, it is? And he said, yeah. And he said, guess who find?" And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, a Martian. It's a human. It's a humanoid on Mars. And I said, really? And he said, guess who finds it? And I said, who? And he goes, you do. <laughs> so take a look at it. And then he put it away. So he was showing me that detail from PIA 10214, which I'm alleging basically is the, is the most significant data to be published in that paper. That is the first image of a human humanoid in its natural state living on another planet ever to be published in the world. And here we are, October of 2009, and that hasn't even made the major periodicals yet, much less the leading newspapers in the world. Mm, yeah, yeah. But that's in fact what it is. And clearly, because of its quantum access capability, that image was sourced from the future and was in the possession of the Central Intelligence Agency when I was a small school child. Okay, that was one, that was 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, it, was, it was not now 1968, 69. So that was 40, 41 years ago. My own father had a copy of that photographic detail. And that shows that they prioritized my Mars findings in their effort to gather data about past and future events. Okay, now the third incident was in 1970, my father said, come on, Andy, we're going over to Curtis Wright. And we jumped in his station wagon. And when we were in the car and my siblings and you know, friends in the neighborhood couldn't hear my dad, what we were talking about, I said, are we teleporting to Mars? I'm excuse me, are we teleporting to New Mexico? Mm. And he said, no, there's some, there's some Martians over there and they want to meet you. And, and, and during that whole trip from our home in Mars Plains over to Curtis Wright in Woodridge, New Jersey, I really couldn't get my mind around what he was talking about, you know, that there were Martians there. So we walked into a hangar there, and as we entered the hangar, there was like a loading dock, and then the rest of the hangar was about eight feet lower. And right at the lip of that stage was a silver craft that looked like a very shiny teardrop-shaped automobile that was hovering next to the stage. It was like going putt, 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 and just staying afloat there. But I could hear it, and it was hovering there. And it was not a flying saucer. It was some kind of high-performance craft that, that the Martians apparently had arrived in. Okay. So we, we went over to the left where there was one of those minimal little offices, just like you have at the space launch facilities where the astronauts you know, on the space shuttle will like, grab their last cup of coffee before getting on the ship. Mm-hmm. And it's just a rudimentary office with, uh, you know, folding chairs and a rudimentary table. 
and there were two men, excuse me, three men sitting there. There were two, there were two other men from Curtis right there and my father. So we went into that room. There were two humans there over on the far side of the table. And on the right side of the table, about ready to leave, sort of like finishing a briefing, were three humanoids that looked essentially human. They were bald. One of the three had a little bit of hair on the back of his head, kind of a male pattern baldness thing going. But the other two were completely bald. They were wearing tight-fitting silver suits with a blood red, a kind of a crimson red badge on the front. In other words, like a, a pentagonal image on the chest, hmm. uh, a crest with a yellow lightning bolt going through it. And they finished a technical discussion with those two humans, you know, from, from the aerospace community at that table. And then we left. My dad and I exited first because we had entered the room last. And then they walked past me. And the third one stopped and turned to my father. In other words, they were walking in kind of an unusual way. They didn't have the same gait as modern human beings. So they were walking slightly differently, and I noticed their muscles were deposited on different parts of their skeletal system in a slightly different way. In other words, their body type was a little different, but still essentially human. And the third one stopped and said to my father, he said, Ray, it was a, it was a pleasure visiting your beautiful planet again, and it was great to see you again. Thank you for introducing us to your young son, Andy. So what he said seemed to confirm what my father said when we jumped in the car, which is that the Martians knew something about me and had actually asked to meet me. Maybe it was because the U.S. government's knowledge of the later role that I would play in history regarding the revelation of life on Mars had been shared with the Martians during their liaison with our aerospace community. That's, that's how I think it fell together. I don't mm-hmm. think there was some non-ordinary basis for the Martians. Okay. to know who I was or from Mars history. Okay. So they walked past and, um, and then they got into their ship and they put, put, putted out of the hangar. And then they slowly did a, a big loping circle around the tarmac. And the end, one of the two engineers from the room was now on my right. And he said, now watch this, Andy. And the Martians came around one more time. And when they got on a straightaway there in the tarmac, they went from about 20 miles per hour to, or 40 miles per hour. I can't really tell. But, you know, they're going fairly fast like a car. But then they went, but that must have been from like 4,000 to 8,000 or like 12,000 miles per hour, like in a second and a half. Mm. It just zipped off the tarmac. It was the most remarkable technical feat that I've ever seen. They just soared off of that tarmac. Mm. And I remember on the way home, my father made a number of comments that he said that, uh, he said a couple of things. He said he had been asked to study their mathematics and he couldn't understand it because in their notational system, two plus two equaled five. <laughs> and I now... We know they have an underground civilization. If you're building things like ceilings that you're hoping to keep the surface of your planet off your head, you know, from crushing you, four posts is going to create a ceiling that you can use for the fifth element, which is the plane to keep to keep your ceiling up. Okay, so maybe that explains it. But he said their their math does not make sense. The other thing he said that we that we've taken them out on field trips around Curtis Wright, and in one incident they spent about a half hour examining some weeds that were clumped together on the ground. Mm -hmm. And now when I as a Mars you know researcher when I look at how relatively devoid of life Mars is, that would make sense. If they're the human beings that have survived in the almost sterile, austere environment of Mars, where there's limited water and limited vegetation, and where there's mass predation going on between competing species, they would really have to be able to study their natural environment to survive and evolve as humanoids. But he said that they were just transfixed by just some common cluster of leaves after a rainstorm, and wondering what it all meant. You know, you have the oak leaf attached to the maple leaf here. <laughs> okay, so they were just scrutinizing these leaves, and so that was kind of bizarre. The other comment they made is that he said, I don't know how three guys can remain cooped up in such a small ship because it takes them 24 hours to get home. So I still have to do the math on the distance to Mars or the average distance, let's say, and then figure out how fast they were going when they left the tarmac there because it was a conventional craft, but it was – it was, I would guess, at least 4,000 miles per hour. It just soared off of that tarmac. Mm. So this third incident was sort of an acclamation where I was being led in a little bit into that inner sanctum of, of basically extraterrestrial human liaison going on around that time in our aerospace community. They were there on some kind of technical liaison mission. And I know that's the case because when we entered the briefing room, they were talking shop, and I couldn't follow any of it. It was all technical. Uh, so um, I can confirm that the humanoids on Mars that resemble us or that are 